I knew it was very important. Um, I think it's very strange that no Western historians uh, took up the topic. Um, and in this way, um, I mean, I could be rather mean and say, well, they were following their Soviet counterparts. I mean, these things did happen. I, I think the way to say it is that, that the, the pervasive narrative of the time, the 1970s and 1980s, um, was one of rational progress. And it was very, very strong in, in the West. And it was also strong in Russia as it was embodied in, in, uh, in communism. And, and I think that Western historians may have, it's not exactly that they wouldn't have dared say Lenin was right to exile those religious philosophers, but they weren't sympathetic. I actually was writing my thesis in Oxford about, um, about the influence of German idealism in Russia, and, and it had, of course, a huge impact on, on religious thinking in, in Russia. And I had a supervisor who, when I went to see him, he said, oh, you're not still interested in that, are you? And that, 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 it was quite a difficult topic to choose. Um, but I did choose it. I didn't make a total success of it, I think, in Oxford, but I, I had so much material. And then I came to write uh, Lenin's Private War, and before that, immediately before it, I wrote um, another book called Motherland, Philosophical History of Russia, in which I, I talk about the ideas. And then, uh, so the two books in a way go, to, go together. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I, I graduated, a, I, finished, I finished in Oxford in 1976 and I didn't write uh, Lenin's, Lenin's Private War until 2002, I started doing the research. Um, other things were going on in my life, I, 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 but I, I, I came back to it and I felt very much that it needed to be written. And I think it was quite a good time because it was the end of the Soviet Union. So I was able to get hold of, a, a lot of material was published um, I didn't actually work in any archives. I, I used published material, but so much was so much archival material was published in the 90s that I found that I, I had more than enough. Um, you know, there, might, there may be something for other scholars to look for, but of course, now it's really difficult to get into the Russian archives. So um, I, think, I think it was good I did it at the time I, I did. And I should mention, you know, there, was, there is one book in Russian uh, Philosophsky Parachod, and I did um, admire that book, and I, I I I did use it, but I I wrote um, I wrote a great deal more than was in that book because that was simply um, well, it was a much narrower focus, and I followed the philosophers uh, into into exile in Paris and Prague and Berlin. Of course, that was a very nice, a very pleasant aspect of the book to go <laughs> to go to those three cities and to choose um, to 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 relive their experiences. In fact, my husband comes from Prague, so we had a lovely time um, following Russians through through Prague, seeing where they lived, seeing where the they went to the park and so on, you know, and uh, seeing how they reacted to Czech language, which of course is close to Russian but has some very there's some, uh, as linguists say, you know, false friends. Uh, I think it's čerstvý, which means fresh in, in Czech and means stale in Russian. And, uh, you know, so you, you get the wrong loaf of bread if you're not careful. So I had, I had enormous fun write, writing this book, um, especially with the travel. And I, I even, I, I wanted to arrive, um, I mean, as you know, if you've read the book and for listeners who haven't read the book, the expulsions took place from St. Petersburg and um, the, not yet, not yet Soviet in name, but the nascent Soviet government um, chartered two German ships to take the, uh, the philosophers and their families to Stettin, um, which was then in, uh, in, in, in Prussia. And that from Stettin, they took a train to Berlin and then uh, they were received by uh, various um, charitable bodies who looked after them. Cause I mean, they had, they had virtually nothing, they had nowhere to go. And then some of them went to Paris and some of them went to Prague and some stayed in Berlin and so on. And I, I wanted to repeat that journey because I thought it must've been extraordinary to, as it were, to steam into Stettin. And, um, I don't know how it is now, but there wasn't there, there wasn't a boat service going anymore from St. Petersburg to Szczecin. So I went to I flew to Copenhagen and I got a boat from 
from Copenhagen to, to Stettin, so that I did come in by sea. And uh, I, I hope that that's reflected in, in the writing because I wanted to bring it, the, the story alive um, of what it was like to arrive there. And, and I suppose the single most poignant um, image that was with me when I started writing the book and when I was tempted to think, well, shouldn't I try to write a novel, was of Victor Frank, who was a boy of 13 on that boat. And that must have been absolutely extraordinary. Such a such an intelligent, sensitive boy, and he was losing his country. And so I kept thinking of him and uh, I took, let's say I took the boat in his name. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of material on Birdjaev and Frank and also on uh, on Lorsky, the the, um, you know, the the author of a big history of Russian philosophy that was used a lot in in the West for a time, um, Nikolai Lorsky and his and his family. And so I was very interested in in the details of their last their last evening in in Russia. I think the, the Birdjaevs um, came to stay with the Lorskys, and. Uh, you know, the usual tensions between couples and so on. And the, uh, at the same time as this momentous event was about to take place and then and then passing through through the customs and having to declare things and uh, getting on the boat. And of course, I was I was also struck by. I don't think there was a single person on the boat. Well, that's that, that's perhaps a bit too strong, but I, I didn't find anyone saying I know we'll never come back. I found people saying, oh, I think we'll be back. You know, three years, four years, how long is this Bolshevik regime going to last? Surely not, it's not going to go on. So, so that's another uh, very poignant thing to notice about the story because they're being sent abroad, but I think they think they're coming back at some point. So, and, then, and then the reality dawns, of course, doesn't it? And um, the next, um, the next 20, 30, 20 years, uh, 25 years are, are, are going to be terrible because not only are some of them Jewish um, and they're going to be persecuted both by the Nazis and by the Red Army coming into Europe. So there are many personal tragedies in this book. Um, it's the, the best known names happen to be the ones who survived. Birjaev, Frank, I'm thinking of, um, Eichenwald, whom I know less about as a person. Um, I, th I think one of the things that struck me is that they are all very different and they all held different views. And so it would be a wrong idea to think that, you know, Lenin had focused on, on men, mostly men, uh, nearly all men, who had a particular view of the world. They were quite diverse amongst themselves. I mean, the religious philosophers, okay, so they they had this spiritual outlook which was antipathetic to to bolshevism but the but there were many others on 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 the so-called philosophy steamer it's called the philosophsky parachot but it's um there were only actually i think 20 philosophers on the boat others were economists um Pichirim sarokin for instance um he wasn't a religious philosopher. I mean, quite quite the opposite. But he was a very very talented man, and uh, rightly, you know, made made his career as a socio a very eminent sociologist in the in the United States. But but you'd be hard put to see something in common between him and and Birjayev. It's just from Lenin's point of view, Sorokin was an SR. Um, he did, he was too clever. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a very I think it's a very interesting list that was drawn up. Um, and Lenin certainly had a personal hand in it, but I think probably um, somebody could study that further, that list, how those, I mean, some of it will be accidental. Um, some of the people who were exiled were um, university rectors. I mean, people who, who belonged to the infrastructure of the old, of the old sort of bourgeois order, but they weren't, they weren't philosophers, but they were, were academic organizers and so on. So, so many different roles. Um, yeah. You wrote about two conceptions of uh, Russian modernity, uh, Marxist mm. and metaphysical. Yes. Uh, so, and uh, the whole plot, the whole story of the philosophical streamer 
uh, you described as uh, Lenin's attempt to cut um, any interpretation, metaphysical interpretation of socialism. Uh, a little bit more about this. Yes, um, I don't understand that verb cut because I couldn't find it in my text. Um, Lenin, um, yeah, I think I think Lenin definitely wanted to um, get rid of a, a, a way of doing philosophy that he associated with with the bourgeoisie, with um, and Lenin associated idealism, metaphysics, with the bourgeoisie. He thought that the practice of idealism was um, advantageous. Um, to that to the to the middle classes um, because it 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 protected their interests and i suppose what he meant was it it well it, it wasn't concerned with the material conditions of living of of every 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 person it was much more about a um the the inner life of individuals and the inner life of individuals tends to arise out of a class that's educated people have, have books they, they can read they can they can they can look at art they can develop their views and so on so uh, i think lenin was definitely this was a, a to exile the metaphysicians was um a piece of class warfare definitely i i wouldn't use the word predictable i would just say that um i, I do feel that lenin felt that he was dealing in a way with his own class with the intelligentsia after all he was middle class he was educated um and i think that you know when we remember that lenin spent a great deal of his own career in exile on uh, when russia was still tsarist russia i mean he was just reversing the order of things but doing it in a very a very strategic and 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 specific way targeting specific people um, I mean, I always like the story that, you know, he purged Russia of nascent Soviet Russia of so many good philosophers and good minds that when he came to found the Institute of Red Philosophy, is it, I think, um, they weren't sure, they didn't really have any people to appoint. He said, well, who, who, who can we get to, to, teach, um, to, to teach philosophy? Anyway, they did, uh, they did find um, uh, one man, Diborin, Abram Diborin. Uh, who was uh, definitely a um, uh, well, definitely a materialist and not a metaphysician. But he soon fell out with the Soviet authorities because he was, in some sense, he was a, a real philosopher. He was a Spinozist and so on. So, um, I think I think Lenin saw philosophy as a as as yet another um, political instrument, ideological instrument, and 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 he had to get rid of. Um, people who were really, really good at exercising, using that instrument in, um, as a cultural force that was quite inimical, inimical to what he was doing, so to, to, to Bolshevism, to, to materialism. So it, it comes back to a very old um, division in German and Russian philosophy, which I find that Anglo-American Anglo philosophers don't always grasp because it's not part of their tradition, but it's this, division between idealism, which is um, Kant, Hegel, and so on, and materialism, which is Mar Feuerbach, Marx. It's that division that happened in the 1840s, um, which Russia was then living out in 1922. And I, I do find that extraordinary. I mean, I am, I, I think I'm a historian of ideas and I, I find the irony of the history of ideas most extraordinary that, 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 that people should be thinking these things and then in Russia they actually happen, they mean that 200 people have to change their lives, uh, whereas in the West it tends to be a kind of academic argument, well you're an idealist and I'm a materialist and we'll, we'll discuss it, but in Russia it's, it's physical, it's, it's real. <laughs> it, it's, um, it's, it's, part of, it's part of what fascinates me about Russia and also terrifies me. Mm -hmm. 
think, well, I think that's a long way on from my <laughs> from my <laughs> period. But I just say about Trotsky, um, Tr Trotsky was wrote an editorial, I think, in Pravda. I mean, it's a long time since I wrote my book, um, justifying the expulsion of the philosophers. And um, he more or less said, well, you know, count yourselves lucky because if you stayed, you'd be shot. And um, or who knows what would happen to you? He didn't say he didn't quite say you'd be shot, but who knows what would happen to you? And 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 that's one of the the moments when I think that Lenin is uh, and, and and perhaps Trotsky too. Um, they're dealing with their own kind. It's it's a split in the in the Russian intelligentsia, and and we're going to get rid of you know the bit that doesn't fit our vision of of um, Soviet modernity. So I think Trotsky. I, I, I think Trotsky was was very much on board on this in this project. I think I think Trotsky is an extremely clever um, and uh, refined uh, thinker and writer. Um, I was a, I only a little bit disappointed by his view of art, the kind of art that the new state should have. That is. Um, I think he was a kind of apologist for, for socialist realism, and I would expect him to be a bit more sophisticated than that. But I think his point of view was that, and, and, and after this view is still around in our own times, in our own society, that under the, under, uh, in, in the class society of uh, 19th century Russia, the ordinary person didn't have access to the cultural greatness of the of the west and of russia and so on and a new egalitarian state would make sure that access was available and of course it did i mean we have to remember that you know the was the great achievement wasn't it of of the soviet union that it educated so many people brought so many people out of illiteracy and so on so um that aspect of the project i think was a good one whether whether it depended on exiling the philosophers is a, is, a, is another matter um, Stalin, um, St Stalin always seems to be different, um, but I, I mean, the only, the only thing I can add, which is not in my book because I hadn't researched it then, but the, the issue of who was going to teach philosophy in, in Russia in the 1920s and what, what the official philosophy was going to be. And I find that a wonderful story and I have actually written an article which hasn't appeared yet, but it's about, um, whether, so, so the Soviet Union needed, was the kind of country, it needed an official ideology, it needed an official philosophy. We don't understand that terribly well in the West because we think of philosophy as a, an academic procedure rather than a, uh, an ideology to, to hold, help hold the state together. But anyway, it, 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 this, this need was perceived already, um, you know, in, in uh, well, probably before, before Soviet times anyway. It, and and Jaborin put forward Spinozism because it was a materialism, but it was also a metaphysics and that and Spinozism in the 1920s in Russia split into different factions. That's a very, very, very interesting story. And it all became politicized. Jaborin was fell into disfavor, um, spent a few nights on a park bench waiting to be arrested. One of the very first stories I've read of, of fear of the purges, this was 19... I think it was 1931, it may have been even Christmas 1930. He wasn't, um, and he left a suicide note. And this suicide note was only discovered in a funny place actually, in, in, in the archives of the Ministry of Defense, I think in 2006, he wrote a suicide note, but he, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't purged, he didn't kill himself. He was given the chance to step away from anything controversial, given this chance by Stalin. Um, and if he did, then he could just carry on um, publishing, and he did that. He, he he just allowed his career to become rather obscure. Um, so Stalin made the decision himself what should be the official philosophy of the Soviet Union, and it had to be a materialism. So in that way. Um, it was an inheritance perhaps from Spinoza, I think. But the problem that, I mean, this is going to get a little bit technical, but it is very interesting. The problem that the ideologists had with Spinoza is that there wasn't a philosophy of history in there. It didn't give them a, a theory of how um, Soviet Russia was going to make 
huge progress after the revolution, catch up with the West, um, become a model for the world of how to establish a progressive society. They couldn't get that out of Spinoza because he didn't have he didn't have a philosophy of history. His was a metaphysics. And so they they took that from Marx. They took the dialectic from Marx, the dialectical theory of of um, of historical historical progress, you know, the, the clash of opposites and the the emergence of a of a sort of superior solution out of our previous conflicting um, materials and attitudes and so on. And they put and Stalin put these two together and, and called it dialectical materialism. And um, again, I, I think it's an extraordinary story. It's it's really a coda to Lenin's private war. Get rid of all the metaphysical philosophers. Actually, get rid of the Spinozans as well, <laughs> and just take from take from philosophy what you what you think you need if you're Stalin and you want to run an autocratic regime. So it is. I, I'm. I'd like you know if there's ever a second edition, I'd love to put it in as a yeah. as a coda. Yes, okay, so the first, um, on, the, on the first thought. Um, well, I, 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 I noticed that I, I summed up what could uh, be said to be true of the Russian um, religious philosophers generally as they left Russia, that they, they, they believed that, um, and certainly this is Birjayev, let me pin it on him because that Russia should be politically compatible um, with Europe, but specific, but spiritually distinct. And when they got to Europe, I think the fact that they were concerned with that spiritual distinctness, whether or not they kept attaching the label of Russia to it or not, I don't think, I think Berdyaev was bigger than that. He was saying, this is, this is the human truth. And the fact that um, Western philosophy at the time, let's say from 1920, I mean, on into post-war, was concerned with anything but spiritual values and metaphysics. Again, it's one of those great ironies of um, the history of ideas that just as um, the metaphysical philosophers were being forcibly put on a ship and sent out of Russia, metaphysics was, was being ridiculed in academic circles in the West. So if you look at our British philosophers, um, Bertrand Russell, but particularly Wittgenstein working in, in, in Cambridge, and then the, uh, the logical positivists in, in Vienna and our own AJ Air language. So philosophy became concerned with language, truth, and logic. Um, but for the Russian philosophers, it was it, philosophy was concerned with a spiritual truth, with a high, higher truth, the sort of thing that the anti-metaphysical philosophers in the West were saying, well, that's rubbish. You can't use words like um, higher truth, like spirituality, like you, you know, what does it mean? It doesn't, you can't, you can't say what it means. So so the Russians entered the Western scene at a time when perhaps um they were spiritual fugitives from Western philosophy that had become so secular, so commonsensical, um, pushing philosophy towards mathematics, towards logic, towards becoming a handmaiden of science, uh, pushing it, pushing it really to the opposite pole of what of what is possible. So it's either spiritual or it's let's say it's logical. And so I think um, there was an affinity between, say, Birdiaev and some of the Catholic philosophers in France. That's a really interesting subject, which I, I, I do mention uh, a, a bit. Um, there was, uh, will, will his name come back to me? Um, a very interesting French um, Catholic, uh, Jacques Maritain. Jacques Maritain, and he had a Russian wife, Raisa, and um, the Birdjaevs and the Maritains used to, used to socialize and, 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 and discuss philosophical questions. 
So I think that, um, if this does answer your question, that, that Birjayev certainly transcended his Russianness and came to represent something spiritual, which was under pressure in the West. And I think, again, it would be a, a wonderful piece of research. Um, I know, for instance, that our um, novelist, Aldous Huxley, who wrote a very famous um, uh, dystopian novel called Brave New World in 1932, he used a quote from Berdyaev on the uh, as, as, as an epigraph. Um, so Berdyaev did fulfill this worry about giving up spiritual values. So that's really important. Um, the other question about the extraterritoriality of of what of 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 any culture, um, whether and the question is whether it needs to be in the country itself in order to flourish. Um, Yes, I think that's, I mean, I, I don't have a strong view one way or another. I just, I can just talk about myself. I mean, I'm a, I'm an entire, I've got some Welsh blood, but I mean, I'm entirely British. And yet, um, most people don't find me very English, British at all. My, my education seems to have been German and Russian. Um, that's because I went to a school that was uh, a, a, an ordinary state school, a grammar school, um, very good, but, but, but ordinary at the time, where my teachers were um, really, really in love with German literature and, and with modern languages. And uh, that was part of our, uh, I would say, our post-war vision in Britain. That it was very, very outgoing, very egalitarian, but very, very cultivated. And, and foreign languages were, were a huge part of it. And I'm afraid in my lifetime, we've, we've lost that. We're, be, we're back to being sort of monoglot Brits, um, which I, I feel very sad about, but I belong to something else. And that was, um, I suppose it was very European, which was, and, and continues to be very attractive. But after the war, it, it did also include Russia. And I think, I mean, Russia, Russian language teaching was introduced to my school um, for the sixth form. So that was, you know, girls of 17 and 18 for, for anyone who was reasonably good at languages could also, could also do Russian. I think there was a strategic Cold War reason why the government encouraged this, but, you know, I didn't know at the time, I was just pleased to learn a, another language and, and Russian was thriving in the universities um, for the for the same reason, I think it was encouraged by the government, but it was also we were very interested in Russia. And um, I was just reading something yesterday from it was a statement in Parliament, you know, our British Parliament in, in 1947, and it was talking about um, some some Russian brides of of um, of British soldiers, and they were having difficulty getting out of Russia and. The House of Lords was discussing this and saying, well, you know, I'm sure you and, uh, and, and other members of this house, we, we have many friends in Russia. We, we are a friend of that country. We, we wish it well. We, we don't know why there is this problem. Of course, it, something really bad was, was, was happening with Russia closing its borders and not letting people out and so on. But there was a great friendship after the war, I think. Um, again, it would be a wonderful thing to... To study and, and it was reflected in in the in in the breadth um, of, of Russian Russian studies in this in this country in Britain um, and maybe some of that was political but a great deal of it was cultural because there's always been a very strong interest in as it were spiritual Russia in this country and for those of us who know Russia quite well and have also had a taste of the political reality. I mean, I will go to my grave not being able to reconcile those two Russias, a spiritual Russia that always has something to add to the West and a political Russia, which is just terrifying and, um, you know, unbearable.
That yes, corresponds yes. to this book, which is a different book, which is, yes. I, I think it was one of the signals that he gave to the West when he first came to power. And um, I think I, I can be a bit critical of the West that we weren't listening. I, I don't know whether, whether I can really say we, but the West didn't listen carefully enough to this, it, it's more than a nuance. It's, 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 it, it's a, it was a, it was in a way, as I see it, um, Kind of a kind of request to be understood. Look, we we do have an affinity with you, and so we 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 do have something called democracy, and it's not a total parody of what democracy might be. And let's say our people um, don't don't totally reject it, but we as a country we cannot be a liberal democracy. I think that's what he was saying, and I do think that the West might have handled its relations with Russia better in the last 20 years if it had taken that idea really seriously. Because as I quote um, a very interesting philosopher, I think he's dead now, but he was alive in 1990. His name is Archie Yezer. Um, I, I quote him in my book, Motherland on the history of Russian philosophy. And he says, Russia is a, is a, is a state and a culture which is constantly in danger of falling apart the center doesn't hold. Um, and so his, and I found this remarkable when I was working on philosophy, he said philosophy, the role of Russian philosophy is to hold, to hold the culture together, to stop these fissiparous um, and separate strands falling apart all the time. And I, I think that's also true in, in politics. How, how you manage the democracy, how far you manage it, whether you shut down free speech and so on. I mean, that's too much, isn't it? But I think that every polity has its particular problems. And I think if the West had understood that, we might have been a little bit closer to becoming compatible. Because I think, I mean, if we go back to the, the Cold War, it was a way of being politically compatible at the same time as spiritually distinct. The spiritual distinction was to be communist which was to be and what did communist mean it meant to be to be peace loving to be not materialistic like the west i mean they were in the end spiritual values and i i think that another mistake of the west has been to underestimate that very genuine russian difference and i i really again i'll go to my grave wondering what happened in 1991 that anyone could have thought that Russia could change overnight from what it was into the US. It's never gonna be like that. I mean, some of the changes have been terrible in Russia and very unspiritual, but still it's a very different country and we should never have expected it. If, I, if we as the West should never expect it to be, to give up its spiritual ambitions. They've become, I mean, Putin um, plays on this on the alleged spirituality of his politics, doesn't he? His his alliance with the the Orthodox Church, which of course never never puts up any any opposition to the ruling um, politics. He um, but he seems to well, does he believe it? I don't know. Perhaps I'm not really in a position. I think he's quite a cynical man. But they are part of they are amongst the instruments of Russian power, religion, spirituality, Russia's spiritual role in the world. And even if we don't like it, I don't think we can expect it to disappear. So to find a way of, of dealing with it because we in the West have, culturally, we, we've sometimes benefited from that, that Russian cultural input, as you got me to talk about earlier. Um, I do remember after 1991, the, the arrival, again, you know, the great exodus from Russia, except it was, it was voluntary, of wonderful artists, musicians, singers. Um, the, we were flooded with the greatest talent. People who, because they'd done their artistic training, I think, in Soviet times, it had been so rigorous. It was magnificent. And another another thing that should be studied. Um, as I as I say this, you know, I, I, I feel the tears coming into my eyes because there's something very, very strong there. Um, and we just 
also on our Western part, we don't seem to handle it very well. So managed democracy, yeah, we should have, we should have tried a bit harder. Yes, I mean, as, as far as I remember, let's say of the of the um, the Russian community in Paris, I mean, it was it was still a, a discrete entity, wasn't it? There was a kind of Russian Paris. Um, so I don't know if it's really a model of of integration, is it? It seems to me that Russian communities actually do stick together generally in terms of people moving to other other countries and cultures um i far prefer the model of integration to the model of um you know remaining separate and and, and creating multiple separate communities um it seems that we we do struggle with that um in this country in britain we used to have it used to be an ideal i think that that uh, people come from other countries had to or should really try to integrate, should learn the language. Um, and, and, and that that's uh, that's not held so strongly anymore. And I think it's created some some difficulties. But that said, it is quite difficult to integrate into into foreign cultures. Um, I you know I don't know how well I would I would cope with living in Russia. I I when when I was a when I was a Reuters correspondent, I spoke I speak very good Russian. Um, Russians used to ask me if I didn't come from if I came from the Baltic states because I I don't know English people speaking Russian have a have a Latvian accent or something. Um, I, I, I suppose I might have been able to because I I'm I'm very I'm very keen on the languages and that would be a route in for me. But I I think it's difficult. It's, I think it's difficult. Um, I think it's difficult in 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 Britain. I, there's a you know, there's, there's a way of of noticing that people are outsiders, that they're different. It's very difficult. Yeah.